the following episode of the Diabolical Podcast may feature spoilers for something, for theirs, something about Mary. Welcome to Diabolical, the show where four long-suffering friends dissect film's most dastardly schemes, then try to improve them. I'm your host, Lord Manly Supreme, and this week's movie is 90s gross-out comedy There's Something About Mary. So, style your hair with that bit of translucent goo dangling from your friend's ear, and let's get diabolical. Hello and welcome to the pod. I'm here with the three titans of mediocrity, otherwise known as the Panel of Peril. Please introduce yourselves and tell us, what is your favourite Farrelly Brothers movie? Hello, I'm Adam, and my favourite Farrelly Brothers movie is the very obvious choice of Dumb and Dumber. Beautiful. Craig here, and my favourite Farrelly Brothers movie is there's something about Mary, but that's a bit boring, so let's say <laughs> Shallow Hal. Uh, now, you've that's always good. been a champion of uh, Shallow Hal, haven't you? Shallow Hal's really good. Yeah. Shallow Hal needs a go. The best bit of Shallow Hal is on the making of the documentary when Jack Black's talking about speaking to Anthony Robbins in an elevator, and Anthony Robbins says he can help Jack Black for a fee. And Jack Black just goes, yeah, blow it out your ass. <laughs> Jack Black, most of his best moments are in like the extras on DVDs. It's the same as School of Rock, yeah. where he's driving around and you get to see a day with Jack Black. <laughs> At one point, he stops outside a billboard for School of Rock, parks his car, climbs on top of his car, copies the pose, doesn't say anything, <laughs> gets back his car and drives off. And then he goes to McDonald's, orders a Big Mac and a filet fish and puts them together to make the McSurf and Turf Deluxe. Yes. <laughs> yeah. On a diet. Yeah. <laughs> People say, but Jack, what about your vegetables? <laughs> Potatoes. Points of fries. <laughs> Ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you do? My name is Gaz, and my favourite Farrelly Brothers film is also Dumb and Dumber. Very nice. And for me, my favourite Farrelly Brothers movie is probably Kingpin. Yeah, it's tremendous. I love Bill Murray in that. I think he was born to play bigger than McCracken. Yeah, yeah. he's great. I don't think I've ever actually seen it the whole way through, Kingpin. Uh, oh, do it. oh, it's great. Wonderful. I've seen it in increments in the wrong order. That's my second favourite Farrelly Brothers movie. Mm. Everyone's second favourite Farrelly Brothers movie. Is it? Except Lord Manly Supreme, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> But I do love Dumb and Dumber as well, so yeah. it's a toss-up yeah. between those two. Yeah. Later, we'll be competing to see who can come up with this week's most diabolical scheme and earn oh-so-scrumptious peril points for the diabolical leaderboard. But first, let's dive into the movie. Released in the hazy, crazy summer of 1998, There's Something About Mary was the Farrelly Brothers' second joint directorial outing following 1996's Kingpin. You may remember the pair wrote and produced 1994's Dumb and Dumber, but Peter Farrelly received the sole director credit for that film. There's Something About Mary opened to widely positive reviews from critics and went on to become a box office success, grossing over $369 million worldwide against a budget of $23 million, becoming the fourth highest grossing film released that year. Would you find Gentlefolk care to hazard a guess as to the top three highest grossing films released in 1998? I stress released because Titanic was the highest grossing film of 1998, taking $1.8 billion, but it was in fact released at the end of 1997. Mm. Scream 2. Uh, saving Private Ryan. Oh, Saving Private Ryan. Yes, Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> Is it number two with $481 million? Ooh. Truman Show? Was that 98? I think it was 98, but it wasn't. It's not in the top three. Hmm. Two big disaster movies Armageddon. Armageddon, boom. And Deep Impact. Nope. Armageddon's number one with $553 million at the box office. The second one is a disaster movie featuring a large reptile. Godzilla. Oh, Godzilla. Huh? Mm-hmm. Yes. That fucking shit show. Godzilla, number three, with $379 million at the box mm. office. Did quite well, didn't it? Yeah. Better than I remember. Yeah. Was it Jamiroquai did this song for that? Yeah. 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 And uh, Puff Daddy, as was. Oh, yeah. And Jimmy Page. Oh, that was it. Yeah, they did Kashmir. Yeah. The riff from Kashmir. Mm. Doing his one riff. 
<laughs> Can I bust out that riff, Jimmy? That's why we've got you here. Best dad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's Something About Mary ranks 27th in the American Film Institute's 100 Funniest Movies of the 20th Century. And in 2000, readers of Total Film magazine voted it the fourth greatest comedy film of all time. I took part in that. Well, I voted for it. Did you? Yeah. Whoa. Ooh. <laughs> that is beautiful. <laughs> In the movie, we follow hapless Ted Stroman, played by Ben Stiller, as he tries to win the heart of the eponymous Mary Jensen slash Matthews, played by Cameron Diaz. Ted is denied the chance to take his dream girl to the prom when he gets his frank and beans stuck in his zipper and eventually loses contact with her. Thirteen years later, Ted works as a writer and is still very much in love with Mary. On the advice of his best friend, Ted hires a private investigator to track her down. He discovers that she's an orthopedic surgeon living in Miami. Ted travels to the Magic City to see Mary, but finds himself embroiled in a bizarre love quadrangle, pentangle, dodeca horse wrangle, you get the picture, (laughs) of potential suitors who lie, manipulate, backstab and stalk to win Mary over. In a heartwarming finale, Ted reunites Mary with her ex-boyfriend, believing him to be the most worthy of her love. As Ted leaves in tears, Mary chases him down outside and tells him that she wants to be with him after all. Ah. It's 119 minutes of fearless comedy, sticky hair and nerd-friendly romance. But does it deserve its place among the 20th century's funniest films? Gaz, if you had the ability to shapeshift your face into any emoji, which one would have been on your face as you watched this movie? Um... The looking down, slightly sad emoji, <laughs> because I used to really like There's Something About Mary, but I don't know whether it's just a case of taste changing as you get older or becoming more sensitive to characters like Ezekiel Warren, Mary's brother, yeah. or any other factors, but I, I, just, I really didn't like it. I think I laughed out mm. loud twice during the course of the entire film. Wow. Once at Lee Evans... And I forget what the other one was, to be honest. No, I, I I didn't have a good time on this watch, personally. Oh, wow. Sad face emoji. Mm. All right. <laughs> Turner. Well, I, I sort of had the pre-anxieties that Gaz was having, I thought, is probably not going to have aged very well. But I don't think that Warren and the others in it are the butt of the joke. So I thought... It, for that reason, it, it's aged quite well, and then there are still some really laugh out loud moments in it. But yeah, I, I did enjoy it, and I wasn't expecting to enjoy it. It has held up better than, say, the likes of Ace Ventura and other films from around that time. So yeah, I, I did enjoy it. Oh, glad to hear it. Craig? Well, I'm with you, fellas, which is to say that I agree with both of you on some level. The emoji that I would have had in 1998 would have been the crying laughing emoji. But yeah, with growing awareness of portrayals of people that are differently abled, some of that has dulled a bit. But by and large, I agree with Turner. I don't think that Warren was made the butt of the jokes. I think it's pretty clear that the people making fun of him, especially Healy, are the, mm. the shit people. Mm. And I think the Farrelly's have generally a good track record of inclusiveness You know, one of the characters in Shallow Hal that's seen as kind of a hero character has Spina Bifida. Mm -hmm. I think they toe the line fairly well. And there there are a lot of funny moments uh, in this that I still love, which I guess we'll we'll come on to later. But generally, I think this is not aged, as Senna said, as poorly as something like Ace Ventura in terms of social tastes. Yeah, I'd agree. And I thought the same thing, to be honest. I thought you probably wouldn't have the same actor playing Warren if they remade it today yeah but i yeah it's hard for me to say for my position of privilege but like say it didn't feel like warren or or his or the group of people in his school or whatever it was they didn't feel like they were being made fun of at any point really Hmm. apart from when when healy was doing it in the film but it was he often has the punchline yeah really doesn't he yeah and you know healy got his comeuppance yeah so i think it was handled quite sensitively and i Mm. I did enjoy it this time Mm -hmm. i think if we all look at films through a modern lens from, say, 30 years ago, 25 years ago or longer, we could all say things that aren't relevant or well, maybe we don't enjoy them so much anymore. But stuff like Something About Mary, Dumb and Dumber and things like that, they were like the indicators of where 
comedy was at that sort of time, wasn't it? It was like quite slapstick, stupid, gross out comedy type stuff, wasn't it really? Yeah. This was the year before American Pie. And I think this movie is aged better than that movie. In some ways. In, yeah. Also, Eugene Levy brings a lot of class to American Pie. Oh, yeah. And Jennifer Coolidge. Yeah, Jennifer Coolidge yeah. is well, yeah. <laughs> She's great. Yeah, yeah, but obviously he plays a much bigger role. And I'm aware that the role as written was not the role that he played. And he wanted to play a more fatherly role. Mm. Uh, and I think that was a huge strength of that series. But in terms of there's something about Mary and the actor who played Warren, not to downplay the tragedy that's the reason for this, but I think we dodged the bullet not having the original actor, Chris Farley, play that role because I think that would have been incredibly insensitive and would have aged much worse. Well, he died when they were filming that. That's when Chris Farley died. Yeah, was it? Yeah. So he probably wouldn't have been able to complete the film anyway, so... Tricky being dead. Yeah. Bit of an obstacle. Mm. Well, maybe they could have done a weekend at Bernie's or something about Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Just wheel him out. Are you okay? Are you okay there? Just being insensitive now, guys. Jesus. <laughs> it's not too soon, surely. 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> 25 years, isn't that the exact limit when something becomes funny? Yes. In the uh, South Park AIDS episode. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before I ask you for your highlights and favourite lines, we're going to play a little game that I'm calling Some of This Shit Is Interesting, But Some Of It Is Made Up. I'm going to read you some tantalising trivia about There's Something About Mary, but I'm also going to throw in some untruths. If you think it's a straight-up fact, say... Those goofy bastards about the best thing I got going. If you think it's bogus, say, how did you get the beans above the frank? <laughs> you got, you're going to have to start making these shorter. Shorter, yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm making them longer, if anything. <laughs> I love the mayhem. They're going to be whole dialogue exchanges soon, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to work for these points. All right. Bobby Farrelly described there's something about Mary as when Harry met Sally meets Blazing Saddles. Those These goofy, goofy bastards. bastards uh, just about the best thing i got going on in my life. Yeah, what Craig said. <laughs> How did you get the frank above the beans? Or the beans above the frank? It is, in fact, true. <laughs> so after making Kingpin, yeah. which bombed in theatres, the Farry brothers thought they'd only get to make one more movie. So they set out to write an over-the-top, absurdist take on a cliche-ridden romantic comedy. Mm. Mm -hmm. right next one the frank and bean scene was based on a real life incident in which the farrelly brothers parents had to help out a kid who'd gotten his genitals stuck in his zipper at one of their sister's parties those goofy bastards goofy bastards just about the best thing i got going on in my life how the hell did you get the beans above the frank i go for the goofy bastards it was in fact true yeah and mary's stepdad was inspired by the farrelly's father who would pull similar <laughs> pranks on their sister's date. <laughs> she left with her boyfriend, Wookie, an hour ago. <laughs> he's so good, Keith David. I love Keith David. I forgot he was in it, and then he opens the door, and I was like, yes! <laughs> he was an absolute highlight for me, that guy. Yeah. I loved him. Yeah, he's brilliant. Amazing. Okay, next. Jim Carrey and John Stewart were considered for the role of Ted, and Jennifer Aniston was considered to play Mary after being introduced to the Farrelly brothers by Courtney Cox. Those goofy bastards. Those goofy bastards. Those goofy bastards. That's the best thing I got going on in my life. For me. That was false. That was a little Ooh. red herring I threw in there. Ah, cheeky. Jim Carrey and John Stewart were considered, yeah. but actually Courtney Not Cox was considered for the role. I threw in Aniston yeah. as a little red herring for you. Okay. I mean, that... A stodgy brown there. She's quite a bit older than um, Cameron Diaz as well, isn't she? She's like, I'd say she's at least five or more years older. Oh, I'm going to have to Google it now, and I? Hang on. Well, hang on. I've got a chart here of... Um... <laughs> of 90s heartthrobs. <laughs> Hollywood women. And their ages. <laughs> it adjusts every day automatically. I like to keep track of their ages. <laughs> Jennifer Aniston is 54. I'm sure she is. And Cameron Diaz. Courtney Cox must be near 60 now. I'm not Googling another one. I'm just in Cameron Diaz. Courtney Cox? You cock. Cameron Diaz is 50. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's some good Googling there, guys. I'm not going to Google the thing that Turner said. I'll just Google something I've decided. Courtney Cox is 58. 58. She's 58. Said it before you did. 
so I win the game. I, double I the knew it. I knew it before you said it. So in your face. <laughs> so that's almost double the age of Jennifer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One little extra bit of trivia there for you. Bill Murray was almost cast as Pat Healy. But the Farrelly brothers decided he was Jesus. too old, unfortunately. Yeah. But I would, I would love to have yeah. seen that. Would have been creepy, though. <laughs> I would have, but I think this is my favourite Matt Dillon performance. No, he's, he's fantastic, yeah. Yeah. Mm. All right, the last bit of Triv. The dialogue between Ted and Mary, when they talk about how there aren't enough meats on sticks, was recycled from a Seinfeld script that the Farrelly brothers wrote, but was never produced. How did you get the beans above the Frank? How'd you get the beans above the Frank? Uh, g- goofy bastards. Well done, Gaz. It is in fact true, yeah. Oh. What? Oof. When they were writing on Seinfeld, yeah, they only ever had one episode produced, and that was season four's The Virgin. Virgin, yeah. But they didn't actually write it. Did you see that part of the story? They pitched it to Seinfeld and Larry David, and they sat there stone-faced, which was their reputation. They didn't laugh at anything during the pitch. And then it got commissioned and they turned up with their script and Larry David was like, it's already written. We don't need your script. (laughs) (laughs) So apparently they didn't actually write the script. Larry David and Jerry just fucked off and wrote it themselves based on their pitch. No way. Yeah. Weird. Didn't get rich by hiring a lot of writers. Mm. I would have guessed that that dialogue interaction was improvised. It seems improvised. Yeah. Yeah. It felt very natural, didn't it? Okay, so let's move on to our favourite moments. Craig, would you like to start us off? Yeah, my very favourite thing, I think, is just the scene with Richard Jenkins as his psychiatrist, who is out to lunch when he's telling him everything that he's done, just comes back in to wipe his mouth, doesn't give a shit, hasn't listened to anything that he said. His line is just, uh, that's very interesting. <laughs> Because I just love Richard Jenkins in general, but I think that is a great role. He does so much with so little. I think the nice bit about that is how much like story you get from it as well, because you already immediately understand that Ted's been telling the same story for like however long yeah. this, with this uh, psychiatrist. It's a genius bit of exposition, actually, yeah. yeah. The crying that Ben Stiller does at the end, I, th- I find hilarious. It's great. Just how raw it is. Ugly crying. Ugly yeah. crying, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apparently the original script had an ending that was a lot darker than Ooh. the ending we got. Mm. Yeah. Instead of going to the traditional happy ever after ending that we get, mm. right after Mary chooses Ted out of her kind of gaggle of romantic suitors, Ted's hit by a bus. Ah. Mm. <laughs> Christ. I think they made the right choice not, not doing that. 100%. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 100%. One thing I never really considered before, but watching it again and thinking about the movie making art behind it, so that, when I first saw this, I never suspected for a second that Dom was Woogie until you find out. Mm. And when I watch it now, they kind of do pepper stuff in that gives it away, but I had no idea the first yeah, time. Yeah, it's it. really nicely um, foreshadowed. Yeah, I love yeah. that. I've got a, a long list, so I don't want to go through it all because uh, I might steal everyone else's. There's a lot. I think I've written the most quotes that I've done for any of the films we've done so far because there's so many, wow. so many little bits, so many little nuggets in it. But there's there's loads of stuff. Mm. Pat, when he's behind, I think Ted goes to see him, and he's sat behind his desk and he gets his up pants. and he's doing up his pants. <laughs> <laughs> That's <a> bit, I was like <laughs> howling. I was like, Jesus. I've, I've written that as well. And I also <laughs> love in that just the way he he says, toe tag with like real <laughs> tease. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like he's out of breath as well, isn't it? It's weird. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't have had something to do with the pants being down. <laughs> yeah. Then just as like a general note, I just thought Lee Evans was fantastic in his physical comedy. Is yeah. just sublime. Yeah. yeah. Gaz said one of his two laugh out loud moments was Lee Evans. And I'm wondering if it's the same as mine. It's when he drops his keys. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but twice. Yeah. It's the... the... The very last second of the second time. <laughs> when he closes the door, yeah. Yeah, he's just <laughs> flinging himself backwards on his crutches. It's so good. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. It's classic Lee Evans, though, isn't it? Because yeah. all his stand-up shows, that's what he's doing. He's throwing himself about, sweating profusely, and that's what he brings to this movie. Yeah. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a shame. You know, he did a lot of movies around that time, didn't he? He did, yeah. But then I don't think he's done an awful lot. Mouse Hunt. Mouse Hunt. Yeah. He was Fifth Element. He was in that as well. Yeah. Mm. Funny Bones with Jerry Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. But I think he's about, I think he's 60 now or something like that. Is he retired now? I think he is, yeah. I have not seen him do anything for a long time. 
a couple of years ago he went on a chat show and he was just talking about how he wanted to have some time with his family, but he was thinking about coming back and doing some stuff. So we, we may see him again. Oh, well. Do you remember on Fist of Fun, they addressed the fact that people used to describe him as Norman Wisdom on acid by <laughs> giving Norman Wisdom acid. Yes, I remember that. hiding under a table. So did. They did it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. Gaz, did you have any highlights you'd like to share? Yeah, Lee Evans, as we've just mentioned, yeah. the, the bit with dropping his keys. And I do just enjoy his stupid English accent, because that's not his real accent. Yeah. That's an American's idea of yeah. an English accent. Yeah. So that's, that's quite good, I think. And the the other bit that really made me laugh is uh, it's Keith David. <laughs> when it suddenly cuts to Ted being wheeled out of Mary's childhood home on the gurney, and it's all chaos all around, sirens, Warren's in the background doing whatever. And then you just very <laughs> faintly hear Keith David uh, say this never would have happened to Woogie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Ben Stiller falls from the gurney. That was actually not planned. Mm. Mm. That was an accident. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he stayed in character and, and went with it, and they kept that take. That is. And when they're wheel- wheeling him out as well, and Warren's in the background shouting, "He was masturbating! He was masturbating the whole time!" There's fucking tons of people there. I was fucking pissing myself. That scene is, you know, the Beans and Frank scene, it, it, it's kind of one of the best known scenes from the film and it's one of my highlights. Yeah. And it's not necessarily the Frank of the Beans itself. It's it's the way it escalates. Yeah. The policeman comes yeah. in through the window. That's it, yeah. It's just, uh, it just is <laughs> so good. Yeah. I love the practical effect, though, of the, the testicle caught in the yeah. zipper. And it reminded me of the bit in the Simpsons movie when you don't see Bart's penis and then you do. Because they do the same kind of joke, don't they? They have everybody looking at it going, oh, my God. And you think, oh, we're not going to see it. And then when you see it, you're like, oh, yeah. shit. Yeah. Yeah. And it's horrendous. Stomach churns, yeah. <laughs> They've got that great art of uh, just gradually increasing the pressure on Ted and making it more and more embarrassing for him, isn't it? And you can feel it. You can start to feel yourself sort of, your skin start to crawl and going, oh. God. Exactly. Oh, and it just gets worse and worse, and then eventually you hmm. see it, and it's like a kaboosh. Speaking of the practical effects, the first time you see Puffy, the dog, as a dummy, when Healy's given him the, the pills and he's he's unconscious, it's a yeah. really good dummy that he's giving CPR to. Yeah. But then later on, when they have the dummy that's fighting Ben Stiller, it looks terrible. I'm not <laughs> yeah. sure. What, is it a different one? Is that meant to look fake specifically to heighten because he beats comedy it of it? Yeah, yeah, that's what it, I'm thinking. Yeah, maybe it's mental, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like a sort of an airplane naked gun type thing where it's obviously right. fake to to heighten it. Yeah, it must be because the one they give CPR to is very lifelike, mm. and when it goes on fire. <laughs> he the yeah, I was laughing out loud at that scene. The resuscitation was was just brilliant. Uh, it's great. Yeah, I've always loved and frequently quote whenever anyone's coming up with a business idea. The seven minute abs guy. That scene. Any, anyone suggests any business idea to me, I'll just suggest that they change one tiny thing about it. Seven minute abs. What if they don't get a full workout? If you're not satisfied with the first seven minutes, we're going to send you the eighth minute for free. <laughs> What if someone comes out with six minute abs? Though? No, <laughs> it's all about seven. It's Seven Eleven, the Seven Dwarfs. That's what made me laugh. That I got on my lines. That Seven Elevens. What? <laughs> Harlan Williams. His turn in Dumb and Dumber as well as the, as the state trooper is fantastic. Yeah. yeah, he's great. Yeah, basically does the same thing, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. One kind of really throwaway visual gag that I love is when Woogie's watching on the TV the news of. Ted being arrested and his wife just comes up from his crush. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's kind of paid off as well in the bloopers and the, the people singing in the end credits. Yeah. And then, you know, he, he's down. It's on, reversed. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, did you enjoy those, uh, the end credits? I thought it was a, a nice treat. Yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah love it's that. good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I always like post credits, you know, type stuff. Yeah, that was uh, always my song in university to. The only thing that I'd get up on the stage and have to sing was um, Buttercup. Nice. Yeah. Buttercup, baby. So, yeah. Good, good, good stuff. Those end credits. Good stuff. Good stuff. I'm glad I didn't go to uni with you, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> Not just me on my own. I should add. That somehow makes it worse. <laughs> what other movies do that well? Uh, you get a lot of movies that, that do it poorly, 
like Toy Story 2 and has the blooper reel in the credits and it's really fake and unfunny. Yeah. Cannonball run. Uh, Liar Liar does a really good blooper reel. I guess I'm thinking more about ones that do a song as well. Oh, right. That's, that's oh, part of remember. the joy of the merry one, isn't it? Mm. I'm sure there are. I'm sure Farley Brothers don't know. Can't think of a single film with a song. I can't think of any off the top of my head. So rather than thinking, oh. subjecting our listeners to just us thinking. I got a good one. I got a good one. Um, the end credits of Slumdog Millionaire, Jai Ho. Yeah. That's oh. brilliant. Yeah, mm. very good. Obviously, I did my usual trivia search for this. I came across some very sort of creepy trivia. And do you want to hazard a guess at what it might be? Uh, Ted Bundy's favourite film is <laughs> Something About Mary. <laughs> no. <laughs> the rubber, rubber boobs on the old lady mm. that Pat Healy zooms in on with the binoculars. Mm-hmm. were Donald Trump's sexual awakening. <laughs> no. If you watch There's Something About Mary, after midnight, a ghost jumps out the screen. And goes, oh, Boom. God. <laughs> like that uh, Kleenex advert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Someone died during the making of No. We've already said that. Chris no. Farley, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, he, he, yeah, but, yeah, he didn't get cast and he died. <laughs> It is that Cameron Diaz spends the majority of the film braless. And if you look carefully at the tops, you can see it all the way through. And I read this before I watched the film, and then I had to pay particular interest. And uh, yes, it's true. <laughs> I was just like, what a strange thing to put in trivia. But then I thought, okay, I'll test it, and I'll look. And sure, it's weird. Just very strange. That's got Turner's uh, seal of approval. Turner tested. <laughs> It's got my lock of the week. Did they say why? <laughs> I don't know. Didn't have the budget for it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do without bras, I'm afraid. Sorry, Don't Cameron. Much. No. <laughs> if Magda's not got a bra, neither of you. <laughs> Maybe she just doesn't. Maybe she didn't want to. Yeah. Bloody feminists. She also got a Golden Globe nomination for this film as well, didn't she? Oh, did she? She's, yeah, quite richly deserved. Uh, wow. She's very good in it. Yeah, she is. Yeah. Clearly, she's not the eye candy. She's the centre of the film. Yeah. The moral centre. I know they're all vying for her attention and, and for affections and stuff like that. Yeah. However, she's the one controlling it all. So it's really, it's a great role for her and she does really, really well. I think the best film was um, Gangs in New York, but this is probably a close second, I'd say. Uh, that's interesting because I hated her in Gangs in New York. And yeah. She's dreadful. Yeah. I think she's a really bad fit. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> I really like it. But Gangs I think she's York. fantastic in this. Yeah. And the mask. Yeah. Mask, yeah. Tremendous. Yeah, but that was purely eye candy, wasn't it? And, uh, and being, being John Malkovich. Malkovich. Yes. Wonderful. A year after this, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course it was. Did everybody enjoy seeing Jeffrey Tambor turn up in this? Yes. I did. Yes. I love anything with him. In- I've even put it in my notes there. Look, old Jeff Tambor. <laughs> old Jeff Tambor. <laughs> have you also written, I like Matt Damon there? Yeah, I have, yeah. I like Matt Damon. Do you mean Matt Dillon? Uh, uh, yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> I like Matt Damon. I like Matt Damon. <laughs> I like the alliteration of Surprise Sarah Silverman. So well done there. Yeah, Surprise Sarah Silverman. <laughs> Beautiful bit of alliteration. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever see the director's cut that they released on DVD of The Something About Mary? Uh, uh, I think so, yeah. No. It's got a lot more Jeffrey Tambor yeah. subplot with him and his pet python. Uh, and he winds up being eaten by the python. <laughs> and it's quite a funny <laughs> image, as I recall, just his arms like pushing up on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Where would you cut that? That's brilliant. I have to dig that one out. Another practical effect that I really love is Healy's chompers, his mini ears. So yeah, funny. God, they're so awful, aren't they? <laughs> all right, let's move on to favorite lines. Gaz, did you have any at all? Yes. Uh, Ooh. Get you. It's back to Mary's childhood home again, and Keith David again. <laughs> Yeah. He's just had his initial look at Ted's mangled Franken beans <laughs> and he calls Mary's mum in and Ted's like, no. And he goes, she's a dental hygienist. She'll know what to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she tries to spray it with like some alcohol spray. <laughs> I guess the zipper does have teeth, so I see what you're thinking. <laughs> yeah. The line of logic there, definitely. Yes. My favourite line is when... Um... Ted is helping that guy move and he's got a thing on his back and he's like struggling with it and his back is making funny noises. And the guy in the wheelchair is going, what I wouldn't give to know what heavy feels like, you insensitive prick. (laughs) (laughs) 
Oh, just me then. Okay. <laughs> no, that's a great line. I love that. It's good, yeah. I've got a few. Some of them happen quite close together. One is when Healy gives Mary a sloppy snog with lots of Tommy tongue. And she, she goes, how does my stomach taste it? And he says to Warren, <laughs> how's my stomach taste, she says. <laughs> just the way he says it. When uh, Mary then sees Ted for the first time in however many years it is, and she asks him, you know, how is everything down there? And he says, oh, I was in and out of the hospital two weeks. <laughs> 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 and when he suggests to her that they go on a date and, and catch up, and she says, didn't we just do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite line was when Ted decides that he wants to see Mary after all, despite Healy trying to put him off her. And uh, Ted says, I, th- I thought you said she was a spark plug. <laughs> Healy goes, no, I said butt plug. She's heinous. <laughs> <laughs> and just to do this line, it's full justice. This is the hitchhiker line that we referred to before. Seven elevens, seven dwarves. Seven is the magic number. It's like you're dreaming of Gorgonzola cheese when it's clearly <laughs> brie time, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Right, I want to move on to some personal questions that I have for each of you. Mm -hmm. Craig? It's not really appropriate. (laughs) Not the appropriate forum for this. No, no. Sorry. Craig, have you ever used bodily fluids to style your hair? (laughs) (laughs) Not intentionally, but I think, uh, you know, like on, you know, on Futurama, when somebody asks Fry, I think it's the 80s guy, asks Fry if you want some hair gel. He's like, Mm. no, I make my own. After yeah. a while of not washing your hair, yeah. the oils, the natural oils of your skin do uh, give you a bouffant sometimes, don't they? So. I wouldn't know. <laughs> not semen, though. <laughs> Just to underline that there. Well, I did. And look what happened to me. <laughs> but it's kept your scalp uh, looking very yeah, good. Yeah, very shiny. Since. Very shiny. <laughs> All those stem cells. <laughs> Adam, what's the craziest thing you've ever done for love? Fuck me. I've done lots of crazy things, so I can't really nail it down to uh, to one thing. <laughs> Give us three. I've tried and failed too many times. Give us your top three. Oh, Christ. Or top I can't eight. Remember. I'm sure I'm sure there's people listening out there who'll probably be able to remind me. Right, well I'll ask you another question that's got a bit of an easier answer. Adam, do you prefer to spank the monkey, choke the chicken, or flog the dolphin? Uh I'd say spank the monkey. Yeah, right. <laughs> a wise choice. How does that even work? You just hit it. Oh, <laughs> he's spanking the monkey. I'd forgotten flog the dolphin, and I I kind of burst out laughing when I heard that. <laughs> that's, that's really good. It's it's horrible listening to him when he's doing that as well, and they all the, the sounds of it. It's just like oh, yeah. I was just like oh, for yeah. God's sake. And Gaz, what's the biggest lie you've told to impress someone? Uh, <laughs> uh, that I'm emotionally stable and well adjusted. <laughs> In 2023, that'd be quite a feat. (laughs) (laughs) After observing Mary for a few days, Pat Healy, played by Matt Dillon, becomes obsessed with her. Desperate to have her all to himself, Healy warns Ted off Mary, telling him she is not the cat she once was. Healy then returns to Miami to pursue her. Spying, lying manipulating and stalking to win her over. When Ted arrives in town and starts dating Mary, Healy teams up with Norm, another sad soul haplessly in love with Mary, to get rid of the new suitor. But despite their most dastardly efforts, true love wins the day. So what did you think of Healy's scheming? Adam? He comes across a lot of unpredicted variables, really, doesn't he? He doesn't doesn't know that there's, like, a plethora of blokes that are in love with her essentially so he doesn't plan for any of that he just adapts his plan just to snare her and then it's because of the likes of norm um and then ted reappearing and stuff like that that ultimately stops his plan from winning doesn't it even then she doesn't i don't think she falls hook line and sinker for him so it's it's a bit difficult to see how he would have you know, sealed the deal, as it were. You know, uh, got to got to first base or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, first base isn't that like Kissing, a, isn't like it? holding hands? 
How is it? I don't know. It's just a. I was just <laughs> using an American. Americans explain <laughs> baseball sex to us. Yeah, base system. Home run obviously is <laughs> when you run around a field together. Home runs at the at the ass. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> 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 well, I was outdid the massive. <laughs> <laughs> Not for the first time. <laughs> what do you think, Craig? Yeah, I think his initial plan is pretty solid. You know, he does a good job of throwing Ted off. He gets a lot of good information about her and prepares well, getting the, the Nepalese coins and all that kind of business that he does there. But I, I think it really falls apart when he reacts to who he thinks is Tucker, the architect, it turns out to be Norm, telling Mary that Harvard's never heard of, of Pat Healy and his response getting Sully to help him do that ruse about him being a Peace Corps guy who pretended to be an architect I think is just terrible. Mm. She and her friends kind of respond to that quite well but would there ever come a point where she go so why did you pretend to be an architect and how would he explain that? You know, that, yeah. that's where it falls flat. He, he does me. kind of explain it, doesn't he, when he's talking on the radio, saying, oh, I just thought girls were all interested in power and status and money and things like that, doesn't he? Yeah, but it's a bit specific that like, she loves architects. It, and... it, the whole thing, he keeps getting caught in a lie, doesn't he? And the, yeah. the way his, his plan works out in the film, it doesn't have much legs. It's going to fall apart or something. Although it's funny, at, at the end, when Ted shows up before he brings Brett Favre in, it's clear that Healy still thinks he's in with a chance. He's like mm. demanding that Mary decide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Norm is as well, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Eagerly yeah. awaiting her answer. Yeah. I love that the fisherman's brought in as well at the end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gaz, what do you think? Uh, similar to the other fellows, the big part of the scheme for him to, to get all the, the inside info on her and, and use that to his own advantage is good but he's not very good on the, the small details, like Craig said, posing as an architect and saying that he's got a place in um, Costa Rica, is it? And Nepal? Nepal. Nepal. He nearly gets caught in the lie quite early, doesn't he, with the mm. Estadio Olimpico. Uh, mm. And he has to yeah. bullshit his way through that, which he just about <laughs> manages. Yeah. The big concept behind his scheme works, but once you drill down into the details, he, he never really stood mm. a chance, which... Uh, I think you'll find in my plan. I've sorted all that. <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> uh, well, for, for my part, I think drilling down into the details is, is a big thing that I felt he should have done more of. So That little teaser. Mm, nice little segue for you there. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'll also say something cryptic. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Intriguing. I hope that gets paid off later. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll uh, I'll try and staunch this nonsense by just saying seven florets of broccoli. Oh, <laughs> good job! You veered us away from the nonsense. There. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, okay, this is the part of the show where we compete to see who can improve the villain's scheme the best and earn precious peril points for the diabolical leaderboard. We'll each share an alternative plan and vote for our favourite at the end. Healy tries to lie, cheat and stalk his way into Mary's affections, but he is ultimately left broken-hearted. Craig, as you recently pointed out that no one has asked you to go first recently, that's too recently, he's in a sentence. Craig, as you've recently <laughs> pointed out that no one has asked you to go first. Recently. <laughs> I'd like to ask Gaz to go first. Gaz, what you going <laughs> Oh, bravo, sir. Bravo. <laughs> well played. You know those flowers that clowns have that squirt water into people's faces? Well, Healy uses one of those in his office before leaving for Miami during his meeting with Ted. Except it's loaded with the odorless poison DDT. <laughs> That's Ted out the way. Look at split. No fucking around. <laughs> if needs be, Use the face-off technology in some way to evade capture. The real meat of my plan. <laughs> the real meat of my plan comes next. And now for the coup de gras, the pièce de résistance, the cherry on top of the cake. How to win the titular Mary's heart? Well, 
let's just say that Healy has a plan for that little old itty bitty situation too, okay? Okay. <laughs> 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 Haven't swung the wrenches in a while, says Healy to a politely smiling Mary. Hey, can you give me some tips here? He asks her. Yeah, don't talk on someone's backswing, she shoots back at the pencil-necked geek. The conversation proceeds from there in much the same way as in the finished film, except instead of being a condo, Healy's imagined Nepalese residence is really more of a duplex, and the blueprints that spill out of his bag are replaced by large green plastic bags. Very large indeed. In the car park, immediately following their session on the shooting range, Mary and Healy say their farewells when the incident with the very large green plastic bags occurs. What are you doing with all of those very large green plastic bags? Asks the beautiful young go-getter. It's just something I work on in my spare time, he replies. Are you a garbage man? Mary inquires, only half-joking. Close, Healy confides, knowing full well that he has his quarry on the hook. I empty the dog shit in bins around the Miami (laughs) Bay area. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well, I have a lot of time to think when I'm out walking the dog, you see. <laughs> Do you pick up your dog shit with green bags by any chance? Uh, no, but the, the bin line is in, in the dog shit bins are green. Yes, they are, yeah. Okay. He, he's the guy that empties the, the full bins. Okay. Full bins full of dog right. shit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep. You can tell a lot about a town from how full each bin is in each area on any given day, he says, flashing those gorgeous pearly whites. Oh, really? What exactly does the volume of a dog shit bin tell you? Uh, How many dogs have been out for walkies, for one thing, and for another, (laughs) what percentage of that group have had a morning or afternoon bowel movement? Fascinating. (laughs) No response. (laughs) Oh, God, it's one of these plans. (laughs) Truly engaged with Healy's in-depth analysis. Yes, sir. From bin to bin we'll go in our open-topped van, collecting dog shits from high society dash and the common man's Labrador. It's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. But it's just a job, really. My real passion is my hobby. What's that? And then the conversation plays out much as in the motion picture. This has removed Tucker slash Norm from play as they will not meet at the architecture exhibit, all thanks to Healy's alluring new profession. So that's uh, all all the little details taken care of, I think you'll find. <laughs> Is that the end? Is that it? That's the end. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a little parentheses at the end there saying... Pause for laughter, applause, etc. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> so prior to their meeting in the car park, I think it's fair to say that Mary's not enamoured of Healy in any way. He's the idiot who ruined her backswing and she doesn't like the look of him. It's only when he reveals that he's an architect an architect that she becomes interested. So why exactly. why do we imagine that she'd be interested in the dog the shit bloke who empties the dog shit out of the bin? Well, I've I've always thought of myself as being quite similar to the character of Mary from the film There's Something About Mary. Right, I won't argue with that. You don't wear a bra enough. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, that's true. But I'm also very interested in the people whose job it is to empty the dog shit bins and how their conversations go when they tell people what they do for a living. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. I no. just think it would be a very funny conversation to have. And you put those two things together, hand and glove. I'm very similar to Mary. I'm fascinated by men who have dog shit bins for a living. There you go. Do you know what? I reckon this th- that kind of plot that you've just described there is probably often in the dreams of people who empty dog shit bins. They play that out on the head on a nightly basis, thinking, how can I ensnare somebody as fit as Cameron Diaz by talking about dog shit? And they just dream, <laughs> and that's it. So you, basically what you're doing with this plan is you've gone, given a lot of people hope. So uh, I, I just want to say, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> I've always thought of myself as a hope bringer. My issue with this, Gaz, yeah. is that Mary specifically talks about someone having a profession similar to architecture or something that they could kind of just leave. Self-employed. Someone right. self-employed that they could leave at the drop of a hat. But 
I was going to say that this is my point, but then I thought, well, there's dog shit everywhere, so... <laughs> there is, but you've got to assume that the next town you go to... And in fact, Miami itself, does that not already have a guy whose job it is to collect dog shit from bins? Quite possibly, but he, he would also have some DDT left over. <laughs> so you could just get that guy to steal the uniform. But what is a dog shit bin if not a beautiful piece of architecture? Uh, That's what I would say. Yeah, I just realised that we haven't addressed this fully, have we? That Healy, who Norm slash Tucker pretends is a murderer, in your scenario, is is actually a murderer. It's just yes. brazenly murdered yeah. Ted yeah. in an office yeah. that and he then, works then at. Then took off somebody else's in front face. Of a lot of witnesses. <laughs> Did anything happen to Ted while he was here? Well, Healy did squirt him with a flower, which I thought was odd. So, uh, as you're all confirming, flawless. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> one, one, one last question. What's your, what's your favourite type of dog poo bin? The one that you just open up and it's got a green bag in it and you can see all the other dog poo bags or the one that's got like a little mm. chute where you open it and you have to deposit your dog poo in there and then you shut it and then it slides into the into the bin well they've both got pluses and minuses haven't they the, yeah the one that's got yeah. like the little drawer can yeah. be tricky and get yes. stuck especially yes. when you've got cold hands yeah but the other one where you just pop it straight in mm. stinks when you open it yeah on the other hand but yeah. it's a lot easier to use yes so you know what this yeah. conversation that you two are having you've really swung me around on the idea that people would be fascinated to yeah. talk to someone who's <laughs> you see <laughs> you see <laughs> This is what happens when you're a dog owner. You think about these things, and people who don't own dogs ha- haven't haven't reached the level of you know enlightenment we have. So mm, yeah, I have owned a dog, of course. I just don't currently own. Yeah, a dog. that's it. You've forgotten, mate. You've come, you've you've drifted back down towards this level. Got of... where you came from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> didn't you didn't become, used to you... pick up shit. That's why you become a snobby <laughs> cat owner, aren't you? <laughs> Yeah, it's just you leave the shit on the pavement. <laughs> just leave it where it, leave it, where it is. <laughs> Fucking won't, won't, won't. If God didn't want it there, he wouldn't remember dog shit in there, would he? Back in my day, you'd see dog shit everywhere, and it, and it was it was white as well. Size of a curly whirly, which used to be bigger. <laughs> <laughs> We've got... All right, Craig, since I was so cruel to you before. Mm. Turn us next, is he? <laughs> <laughs> no, go on, Greg. All right. Pat Healy is shown to be a surprisingly good detective. Through surveillance and subterfuge, he is able to discover everything he needs to seduce Mary, despite the fact that he's a tactless, pompous ass. More impressive still, that he manages to track down Mary at all, despite the fact that she's changed her name, a fact unbeknown to Ted when he first hires Healy. His plan falls short because he stops there. Picking up where he left off, I turn my detective skills to delving into Mary's past more thoroughly, to learn as much about her as possible, and arm myself with the tools to not only seduce Mary, but to hold on to her too. It's likely the first straight dope I'd uncover would be the 411 about my grubby pal Don Woganowski's restraining order. I can't risk him ratting on me, so the first thing I do is follow Mary's lead and get my name changed by Deepole. If Mary hears Ted hired some Seamus named Healy, she won't immediately link that name to me, and that'll buy me time to get him chased out of town by the Miami PD before he can eyeball me. My next obstacle is Tucker, the snooty Brit architect. It wouldn't take much digging for me to discover his secret and expose him. Then I get my buddy Sully to drop a nickel and pose as my old Harvard professor Kim Green, verifying my own credentials over the horn while Magda listens in. With those guys out of the picture... That only leaves Ted. I can't prevent him from finding out about Mary from his chiropractor, so at some point he's pounding asphalt down to Miami with Woogie in tow. It's clear by then that my veneers haven't had the intended effect, and I overhear Mary telling Magda that she loves braces, so I'm booked in for some more dental surgery ASAP. I call around the local hotels quickly until I find out where Ted is staying, and I stake the place out. A few choice photographs of Ted and his buddy Dom or to come in handy later on. Over the next few nights, Mary has a little trouble dressing for dates, never able to find the shoes she planned to wear with each dress. Then, she receives a typewritten note, along with some photographs of Ted and Woogie holding several pairs of Mary's shoes that mysteriously showed up in Ted's hotel closet. He'll claim it's a fit-up, but the damage will be done, 
and she'll tell Teddy to take a powder. That's when I swoop in to pick up the pieces. Moustache gone, braces fitted, dressing more like a geeky dipshit. You know, the goofy look she digs. From out the window, Jonathan Richmond sings. Well, he leads a good gum shoe. He fucked the pizza boy. He fucked that stalker Ted. And he got Woogie a new cum shoe. Which he's probably right now jacking off into. So now she'll settle for this dipshit. <laughs> and he'll give that old man lots of speed. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Taking care of the old man at the last minute there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, did I miss where did Healy or when did Healy get all of Mary's shoes? He's been dating her for weeks at this point, so he just oh, okay. sneaks them out every now and then. Okay. Takes them One to, shoe at to a Ted's. time. He kind of hides them somewhere and then takes them to Ted's hotel, like on a on a night when he knows he's going to photograph him doing it. How did he learn that the Woogie has a, a shoe fetish? Well. The details of his restraining order would be available to a private eye. So someone who okay. someone who uses the skills that Healy has could find that out. Fair. Good point. And okay. sorry, remind me how he got rid of Norm? He just discovers that he's that he's Norm. Okay. So really quickly, after he meets Tucker, he starts investigating into who Tucker is and where he's from and stuff. Basically I'm saying if he used his detective skills more often, he would have found out that Norm was a fake as well. Okay, very good. Any more questions? Mm, don't think so. The only other note I had is that surveillance and subterfuge would be a good name for private investigation firm. <laughs> Terry Surveillance, <laughs> Steve Subterfuge, together. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's our, our sitcom that we do. Terry Surveillance and John Subterfuge. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Adam. What would you have done differently? Oh, what wouldn't I have done differently? Oh, you'll soon find out. <laughs> oh, I'm on tender hooks. Let's just get one thing straight right now. Nice guys finish last. This film is lying to us. How many people have been tricked into thinking that being a top draw, occasionally dopey person, is the key to starting a successful relationship with the person of your dreams? Enough! I am going to set the record straight. I will restore the balance and give the scumbag his reward. Pat will take his rightful place at Mary's side. So after his little bit of spying and information gathering, before he meets Mary in person, he acts. Healy is well and truly smitten, although he doesn't really know why. He must have Mary. He simply must, and by any means possible. Any means possible. Healy uses all his experience as a private eye, administrative assistant, and, in his spare time, an amateur master of physics to create a machine made mostly from gluing lots and lots of highly technical items together that even I don't fully understand and would struggle to explain to you. That causes <laughs> rips in the space-time <laughs> continuum somehow and allows entry to different dimensions where perhaps Mary is a stripper, or Ted has died already, etc., etc. You catch my drift. <laughs> Healy travels to a dimension where his alternate self is doing quite well. Let's say he is an author and doer of charity work. Easily bumping off his alter self, he assumes his life, he tracks down Mary and finds she isn't a doctor, she is a struggling waitress failed model working to make ends meet which Healy finds much more agreeable and far easier to get Mary to like him rather than spend loads of time constantly adjusting his personality and his physical appearance. Healy knows that to keep such a charade up would be incredibly time-consuming and frustrating. Now that he has conveniently finally mastered cross-dimensional travel, it's a far simpler way of convincing a woman to like him. He pops into where Mary works for Brew and gets her attention and splashes the cash a little bit by ordering lots of pancakes or something. Mary agrees to go on a date with him and the rest, as they say, is history. It's a bit far-fetched, isn't it? <laughs> is it? <laughs> well, after, after, you, after you've, you said it is um, 
you know, they'd find dog shit interesting. I thought, well, thanks, Kels, for that. You've set me up for peach for this one. <laughs> because your plan's dog shit. No, because my, my plan is, is, is just... It's it's just as crazy as some of the things that happen in the film, isn't it? Do you know what? I'm saying that because I thought it would be a funny thing to say, but I honestly love it. <laughs> <laughs> Were you inspired by an episode of Star Trek or something? No. Or Jet Li movie, The One? I was just really struggling. I thought, how can Healy make this stick? Uh, and I thought... Sliders. Yeah, and I was just like, the yeah. only way you can do it is going through like multiple dimensions and stuff and trying to find this Mary that's actually doing a bit a bit down on her luck or it's totally different to the one in the film. Mm. So. so my one problem uh-huh. isn't with the extra dimensional travel. Yeah, yeah. let's skip over that because it's a, <laughs> that's a fucking can of worms I do not want to open. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I told you, I can't even explain it, so don't ask. <laughs> you said the benefit of this method for Healy yes. is that he doesn't have to keep up a pretense yeah. that he's someone he's yeah. not. But surely if he bumps off his more successful self in this other world, he would have to I do said that. He doesn't constantly have to change himself all the time i think you'd have to do it more he, constantly in this scenario. no he's just he just he just takes he takes up um the identity of the guy the author he kills that's pat healy the world famous yeah, author. and that means he's got to write a that's it. write a book surely hasn't he he's not going to be able to do no that. he just re- he just retires okay <laughs> <laughs> Any... <laughs> what this reminds me of, uh, Turner, this plan, yeah. is yeah. the what happened next round on a question of sport when Ian Botham didn't have any kind of answer to give. Every time he'd just say, I don't know, a UFO comes down and lands on the pitch. <laughs> your, your plan is the equivalent of that. Fucking <laughs> uh, okay, beefy Turner. Well... <laughs> Well, I'd, I would say, you know, this is anything, anything is possible in film, isn't it, really? And they, yes. the fact that they put a dog into a full cast, would that actually happen in, in real life? <laughs> would jizz make hair stand up? Thereby proving extra dimensional travel. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying, I'm bringing these things to light. <laughs> Just asking questions. Just, just, asking just, questions. just throwing out truth bombs. <laughs> That's very nice. Bon. If there are no further questions, I will bring us home. <laughs> God, that's over with. Mary. Mary? Mary. Mary, 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 Mary. <laughs> Mary. <laughs> I take a long gulp of my harsh grain alcohol and wipe the bitter tears from my eyes. I done fucked up. I let the girl of my dreams slip through my fingers. What a grade A doofus. I'd do anything to get her back. But it's no use. I don't deserve her anyway. I sit down and lift the lid of my record player. Perhaps some music will raise my spirits. I flick through my record collection pull out an old copy of Revolver by the Beatles and place it on the turntable. As I lie back to the foot-tapping feel-good funk of the Fab Four, I recall a friend telling me that this album includes some messages that can only be deciphered when the record is played backwards. The 60s was a wild, wild time. But then it hits me. I know how I can win back Mary. I jump in my car and head to the video store. I head straight for the romance aisle make my purchase and leave. I head to Sully's and borrow his VHS recorder. I'm going to need two. Once I'm home, I set to work. The next morning, I shower and put on my best check trousers and Tommy Bahama shirt. I lacquer my hair, grab the present for Mary and head out. I look good. I knock on Mary's door. She answers and is understandably cautious. No need to be wary, Mary, I say. I know I messed up. I toyed with your emotions. I'm sorry. I'll never forgive myself for that. But please take this gift as a token of apology. I hand over a neatly wrapped package and prepare to say my goodbye. Well, you know where to find me if... I purposely tail off as I hang my head and turn to leave. Once the door closes, I boot it down to my car and pull out my long-range listening device. In moments, I hear the crinkle of paper. She's opening it. Inside, Mary finds a copy of the modern romance for our times, Harold and Maud. I hear her put it in the machine and hit play. As Mary enjoys her favourite film, the screen will flicker from time to time. 
Nothing out of the ordinary. Just a common issue that's plagued home video viewers since the 80s. Little does she know she's being fed hidden messages. Ted is a murderer. Pat is a real stand-up guy. <laughs> Ted was the second gunman on the grassy knoll. <laughs> Pat has a generous lovemaking style. <laughs> Ted pokes newborns with thumbtacks. <laughs> Pat saves kittens from burning trees. And so on and so forth. The more Mary watches, the stronger the subliminal messaging will take hold of her mind. In just a few watch-throughs, Mary and I are stepping out for soup and shakes, while Ted is a thing of the past. I'm going to consult <laughs> guys on this. Is subliminal messaging a thing that works in real life? It is. Yes. But I think there's a point of overload. No, leave it there. Leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> it, cut that bit, Craig. It generally has to be the same message restated constantly rather than, what was that, about six different things? <laughs> so whether that would work is, is highly debatable, <laughs> in my opinion. There you go. Highly debatable. Have you ever seen... Clockwork Orange. Yes. Yeah. There you go. The proof's in the pudding there. Has Gaz seen a Clockwork <laughs> Orange? Gaz was first in line to watch it when it got unbanned. Well, the, the principal part of the Ludovico technique in that is Beethoven's fifth, which would constitute mm. one thing. That's the psychic driver hearing that one piece of music, isn't it? Mm. Ah, Just okay. associating it with a vague concept of violence and it making him feel ill. So, yes. What what's the judge thing? Sustained or Yeah, sustained. <laughs> yeah, sustained. sustained. Yeah. Overruled. Yeah. You need to say overruled. Overruled. That's it. <laughs> overruled means that you agree. Don't tell him that... don't tell him, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's say though that if she watches this VHS multiple times Yeah, which she will. And associates Harold and Maud with all these things yeah. to say about Healy, that, that that could feasibly work. Yeah. So my big question is your plan starts where Healy's already in a bad place. He's been rejected already by Mary. So at what point does this happen? Um, I was thinking, so it's after she's with Ted. So Norm's already out of the picture. Oh, so after the end, the whole yeah. movie's over. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. Yeah. He's going back in there and he's apologising for his behaviour. He knows he's been bad. And then he fucking <laughs> subliminal messages him. I feel like that's kind of out of the bounds of, don't want to no. keep harping on about this, but the premise of the game... <laughs> No, 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 no. <laughs> this is what he'd have done differently. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing differently. Just a sequel. <laughs> That's what I'd have done differently. I'd have, I'd have made a sequel. Yeah. There's something more about Mary. <laughs> There's something else about Mary. That's what it should be called. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Would she even accept the gift from him at that point, I think? Mm. She knows he's a scumbag. Would she not just refuse it or chuck it in the bin? You see, what I did was I solved that with one line. I think you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, then. What, what was the line? Let me just uh, pull it up again for you. <laughs> where's Ted while this is happening by the way is he w not watching Harold and Maud with it well you know where to find me if I purposely tail off as I hang my head and turn to leave that's going to be playing her heartstrings she's going to go oh no he's a <laughs> decent guy after all and that's going to cause us to open the gift so where's where's Ted while this is happening uh, Ted he, uh, he was called away to work <laughs> he works from home he's a writer he's a sports writer isn't he so sometimes he has to go to the games <laughs> Mm. Okay. Okay. Phew. <laughs> it was only uh, slightly torn apart. <laughs> okay, some absolutely diabolical schemes there, but there can be only one winner or two or four, but never three. <laughs> we had Gaz's plan, which I'm calling dog shit and murder scheme. <laughs> we had Craig's plan, which was quality detective work. We had Adam's plan, which was cross-dimensional romance. And then we had my plan, which was subliminal messaging. It's time to vote. And remember, we can't vote for our own plan. And if either of you three wins, you will receive two peril points for the Diabolical Leaderboard. Yes, we know. As host, if I win, I will only get seven points as I pick this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. One point. I'll get one point. <laughs> Those ones look like a seven if you squint. They do. It's unfortunate <laughs> that I've written it out. Is everyone ready? Ready. ready. Contestants, ready. Ready, uh, ready. All right. 
Craig, who have you voted for? Well, <laughs> physics aside and plausibility, I had to vote for the one I enjoyed the most. Oh, which is oh, Adam. Well done. <laughs> Adam, and who did you vote for? Well, is this going to be some kind of mutual spanking of the monkey here? Ooh, possibly, <laughs> possibly not. Purely for my sheer amazement at how long we actually talked about the plot, post plot, I've gone for <laughs> Gaz. Hey. Okay. And Gaz, who have you voted for? Well, I voted for the most logical plan, which again was Craig. Oh! Deciding vote. Yeah. I voted for the plan that had the best song. (laughs) (laughs) There are some buddies in there somewhere. I'm going to take back some of the things I said about you. (laughs) This is just turning into a fucking popularity (laughs) contest, come die with me type thing. No, you don't understand what I was saying about Come Down With Me, Turner. I don't know what You're just doing it to say the piss, are you? Well, do you know what? It's the season over. Oh, can I change my vote? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Get thinking about nickname, Craigie boy. I, I had one last season, and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> so, Gaz, what does that do to the Diabolical Leaderboard? Well, despite having two episodes of season two to go, we have a winner as Craig <gasps> is on 13 and a half points. And so his lead is He's now unassailable. unassailable. Oh, yes. shit. In second place is myself <laughs> with eight and a half points. In third place with five and a half points is Lord Manly Supreme. And in last place with four and a half points is Adam. Oh, okay. Ooh. So it's a race to see who's the toss that comes last now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should do uh, the last place gets their nickname chosen for them by the no. other three. No, 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 no. <laughs> Get a bit confusing. <laughs> Two made up names. Yeah. Okay. Craig is next week's host and champion elect. Please tell us what film have you picked for us? Do you want to know? What it is. Uh, is it Die Hard 2? Pulp Fiction. It's The Matrix. Oh. It's a good picture. Yes. Good, Matrix good, 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 awesome. good, good. Excellent. Okay, well, that's it for another episode. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to follow us on your podcast platform of choice so you never miss an episode. But most importantly of all, tell your friends about us. Seriously. You know, really get on their case about it. Call them up hourly, ask them whether they've listened to it yet. And if they haven't, tut loudly and hang up. It'll be a right laugh. And we'll get the extra listeners we so desperately crave. Follow us on the usual social medias at Diabolical Pod throughout the week for more mildly interesting content. Join us next time when we'll be dissecting The Matrix. And remember, getting your bits stuck in your zipper could turn out to be the best thing that ever happened to you. One, two, three, gas. Why do you, you build, build me up, up buttercup, up, baby, baby, just to let me down? Let me down. And turn me around, and then worst of all, worst of all, you, you never call, baby, when, when you say you will, say you will. will. But I, I need you still. I need you. Hey, hey, hey. More, More than, than anyone, anyone darling. darling. <laughs> I'm rewarding myself with a salted caramel lolly. Salted Ooh, caramel. Oh, it's good. I do not like salted caramel. I like no. unsalted caramel. No, no, you've missed, you've, you've missed, you've missed the reference there. Salted caramel, mm. salted pork, Highlander. <laughs> the salted caramel holly lolly is particularly good. There's something about Mary ranks 27th in the American Film Institute's honey. Uh, honey, I was going to say honey. Fuck me. <laughs> There's something about Mary ranks 27th in the American Film Institute's honey, honey, I can't say honey, 100. (laughs) (laughs) Can't say honey, 100. (laughs) Right, 100. Okay. This is going to be a very, very long episode. (laughs) 
There's something about Mary ranks 27th in the American Film Institute's 100 Funniest Movies of All... No. Oh, fuck. (laughs) (laughs) That is a fucking... (laughs) 